Hello and welcome. My name is Heather Nelson. I'm a clinical chemistry fellow and assistant medical director in uh, the automated endocrinology lab at ARUP Laboratories, and, as well as a clinical chemistry fellow in the, at the University of Utah. Uh, lab on chip technology has begun to revolutionize diagnostics, particularly at the point of care, due to its portability, fast time to result, and ease of operation. In this presentation, my goal is to provide you with an introduction to lab on a chip technology in clinical diagnostics, and particularly in the clinical chemistry space. And although I will present on chemistry-based platforms, much of the technological principles, as well as the advantages and disadvantages of these lab on chip devices for medical testing that I'll discuss will also apply to other uh, fields such as molecular and infectious disease. So at the end of this presentation, you will be able to explain the um, advantages and disadvantages of various lab on chip technologies for diagnostics, discuss the challenges associated with standardization and commercialization of lab on a chip devices, as well as by examples of FDA approved lab on a chip based diagnostic devices. To give you an overview of what's to come, I'll start with an introduction. I'll go over the basics, what is lab on a chip? And then I'll discuss some broad stroke advantages and disadvantages of the technique. The bulk of the presentation will be discussing different lab on a chip technologies. So we'll talk about capillary flow platforms, pressure driven flow platforms, centrifugal microfluidics, as well as digital microfluidics. And for each of these, I'll try to provide at least one example of a current um, FDA and CLIA wave device that's being used clinically. Um, and then I'll finish off with discussing some remaining challenges and kind of leave you with a food for thought of, of things we need to be thinking about as we move forward. So what is lab on chip? It's a class of devices that integrates one or more laboratory techniques into a single um, chip. And it's, this chip is only millimeters to a few centimeters in size. And because microfluidics is the core technology in lab on a chip, the term microfluidics is often used synonymously with lab on a chip. So microfluidics is the science and technology of systems that move external, extremely small uh, fluid volumes down to less than picoliters through microchannels. And these microchannels are on the order of nanometers to microns. And as you can, as you will see throughout this presentation, lab on a chip may take many different forms. Many will integrate movement of fluid through channels on a chip via capillary action or pressure driven system. Some may use centrifugal force to move fluid through the chip. Uh, magnetic particles have been introduced into some systems to enhance sensitivity by, uh, by capturing and concentrating the analyte, and that helps increase signal to noise. Um, and then all of these platforms need to be connected to some kind of detector for readout um, and transmission of the signal. Uh, a very big interest in the field and in the research and development arena right now is using smartphones as a universal detector because these are uh, very widely available. Um, and so that's kind of where the field's going. But overall, what's summed up in this figure is that the, the, the purpose on lab on a chip, and particularly in the point of care, is to be able to develop a device where you can put sample in and get a result out without much handling or manipulation. So some of the advantages of lab on a chip are that it uses very small sample volumes as well as uh, very small reagent volumes. So you're not um, going through consumables as much. Uh, it has increased speed to a result. So turnaround times are uh, rapid on the order of minutes. And then it's easy to operate. Um, the goal is really to automate and integrate the complex workflows um, all within the instrument. So there's less hand handling of the specimen. Also, the, the small side, size lets, lends it to be portable, which is perfect for point of care testing. It's easy to bring in and out of patient rooms um, so that it can be operated at the bedside. The goal of lab on a chip is also to develop low cost diagnostics. However, I don't think we're quite there yet. If we look at what a cartridge on a point of care device costs right now, it's still quite a bit higher than sending a single sample to the central laboratory. Um, and a lot of this, which I'll get to during the presentation, has to do with um, the point of care devices using lab on chip are multiplex. So instead of ordering one analyte, you're getting 10 results. Um, so the goal is to get it low cost. Some are there, um, but certainly not all of them yet. 
And then lastly, the ability to multiplex is a huge advantage of lab on a chip. So we can analyze many uh, different analytes on one single test strip. Uh, the most prominent disadvantages of lab on a chip are that they are much more prone to clogging because we're dealing with such small microchannels and fittings. Something as simple as a small fiber or a piece of dust can clog these narrow passages. Built-in filters can mitigate this risk and they are implemented into many devices, but it has yet to completely prevent clogging. Another very important parameter that applies to lab on a chip is that even small variations in physical quantities during the microfluidic ex um, experiments can dramatically change the results. So therefore, packaging of critically controlled reagent volumes and appropriate reconstitution and mixing uh, with the sample is very critical to generate reproducible results. So platforms using larger volumes that we, for example, what we use in the central lab, these can uh, buffer slight reagent volume shifts to some extent and therefore are often more reproducible. So for example, if we consider a one microliter loss of reagent. When we're working with a total volume of 10 microliters, this is a 10% difference. That's, that's pretty significant. However, when we're working with a one mil total volume, this is just a 0.1% difference. So that kind of gives you an idea of why microfluidics is so much more sensitive to volume shifts. Lastly, the, the micromanufacturing process required to make lab on a chip is very complex and labor intensive and it requires expensive equipment and specialized personnel. This makes scalability and commercialization quite difficult. Um, however, there, there has been a recent breakthrough and expansion of 3D printing, which may help overcome some of these challenges, uh, particularly in the manufacturing of plastic microfluidic chips. Um, so now I'm gonna shift to the kind of the meat of the presentation. Um, and I'll talk to you about the different platforms uh, that are used in the clinical chemistry space. And um, coupled with these platforms, you'll see each requires some kind of detection strategy and most common for uh, clinical chemistry is either electrochemical or optical detection. Um, so for electrochemical detection, uh, you might have measurement of current uh, during oxidation or reduction processes. You can measure impedance as a function of excitation frequency. Uh, you can measure potential changes that are usually translated as voltage changes, or you can measure current as a function of potential. For optical measurements, that might include digital or visual color analysis. It could also um, include measurement of absorbance at a particular wavelength, uh, measurement of fluorescence or luminescence, and then also measurement of a change in refractive index. So the, the moving into the different platforms, I'll start with the most simple one, capillary flow. Uh, lab on a chip assays based on capillary flow were the first microfluidic platforms described and commercialized. And as the name suggests, these platforms rely on capillary flow induced by using structures with high internal volume and small channels that absorb liquids convenient. And this is achieved by using some kind of hydrophilic material in the channels so that it can help draw the liquid. Um, often capillary flow results are read optically and some can be qualitatively interpreted just by a change of color visible to the naked human eye. Um, but for a quantitative readout, optical detectors can be incorporated into the platform, um, usually by some kind of external device. An advantage of this capillary flow is that it doesn't require pumps for producing liquid flow, so it makes it especially suitable for low-cost uh, applications. Some of the disadvantages of this, uh, this mechanism is that it's difficult to control the flow since you're just relying on that capillary action, and consequently you have some difficulty in mixing of the reagents. One of the longest used lateral flow based assays on, based on capillary action is the at home pregnancy test that many of you are probably familiar with. This test has been and continues to be the gold standard for cheap at home testing. And although we don't think of this as a microfluidics or a lab on a chip because it does require a larger sample volume and it doesn't contain these discrete microchannels, the technology regarding the fluid motion and interaction with the rea uh, reagent is the same as what we're using in capillary flow uh, microfluidics. 
So as this figure illustrates, the sample pad, uh, the sample is applied to the pad, and then it moves laterally through the capillary action, where it first interacts with a conjugate pad that contains labeled human uh, chorionic gonadotropin antibodies, as well as labeled control. The analyte in the sample complex with the antibodies will then continue to move laterally down the chip, and then it will complex with capture. It will be immobilized by capture antibodies and allows a readout through it optical detection of the color change. Um, so another concept to recognize and, and when we look at this platform is that it's critical in these lab and chip devices and point of care testing to have built-in controls because each strip represents its own test, so it needs its own controls. It's not like, you, like in the central lab where we can um, control for the instrument in the morning and then run it throughout the day. Um, it's, it's each one's treated as its own entity. If we look at something a little bit more advanced, we can discuss one of the most successful pass, uh, passive capillary flow devices, the glucometer. Uh, this provides a quantitative assessment of glucose concentration in a drop of whole blood through integrated sensors for the electrochemical detection of glucose oxidation. So as you can see in the figure, enzymes such as glucose oxidase are immobilized in the test strip. Whole blood is then touched to the sample entry and pulled in by capillary action. As glucose in the sample is oxidized by that immobilized enzyme, electrons are freed and collected by the electrodes, which measures current proportional to glucose concentration. So then if we next look at a more comprehensive point of care device that uses uh, microfluidics, and you can see in this image the microchannels on the, ch on the cartridge, we can talk about the Allure triage. This is a Clio Wave point of care device based on capillary microfluidics. The platform has tests for blood and urine chemistries, uh, for example, cardiac markers, creatinine kinase, myoglobin, and troponin and it requires just 225 microliters of whole blood plasma or urine. And so shown here on the right is an example of that single-use test cartridge. You can see there's a sample entry port, and then capillary force moves the sample through a filter, which helps separate cells from plasma, which eliminates the need for uh, centrifugation or complex sample preparation. And then the sample continues into the reaction chamber, where it mixes with dried reagents, and then it's guided through microchannels that has built-in controls and structures to ensure appropriate time and completion of the reaction. Uh, overall assay methodology employed on this cartridge is immunoassay, in which the analyte is binding to fluorescently tagged antibodies um, that are captured on the device for detection. In order to use these Allure triage cartridges, the labs must have the Allure Triage Meter Pro Detection Device. And what this is is a portable fluorescent instrument. It uses a laser light source that hits the test cartridge that has been inserted into the meter. And this causes fluorescent dye in the test device to give off energy, such that the more fluorescent dye that's given off, the stronger the signal. And this provides a readout as to how much substance is present based on standards that have been programmed into the meter. Um, and this Allure Triage Pro can be used in the laboratory or at the point of care. Shifting gears now to the pressure-driven flow platform. These platforms are arguably the most versatile fluidic platform, especially when ample means of fluid manipulation are integrated. They may contain mechanical pressure or pumps to create that fluid flow, and then also include valves that facilitate more precise control of that movement. These systems are inherently more complex, and they will require integration of both active and passive components. Uh, this can create some challenges with device handling because it com becomes more important to try to separate the more expensive active components from the passive components, which are coming in contact with sample and must be disposed of with every run. This figure over here on the right shows the general scheme of a lab-on-chip device. Uh, for point of care applications with different passive and active structures, which are arranged um, such that distinct applications can be uh, carried out uh, on the chip at hand. 
So you can see that it will contain a means of introducing the sample. Um, in here, they're applying the sample using a syringe and depressing the syringe applies the pressure needed to create fluid flow. Um, and then some might uh, alternatively have pumps or motors that do that. Uh, it will often initially go through some kind of filter to clean up the sample and separate out the plasma from cells. And then it will include some valves that uh, help control the timing and volume of reagent mixing. The cartridge will also include dry and or liquid reagent storage, some kind of means of mixing, um, maybe even separating and then incubating the, flu the fluids, as well as structures for analytical readouts and waste. Uh, the, an example of this technology is the iSTAT. iSTAT was one of the first commercially successful lab-on-chip based platforms for human diagnostics. And it's a single-use cartridge based system with all the analytical requirements for the performance of a test contained within that single cartridge. So this includes the sample entry well, um, a fluidic channel, a calibrant solution and reagent which are stored in that central bladder. Um, it then has some thin film electrodes, which are coated with a specific ionophore on a silicone chip, and then a waste chamber. This cartridge must be placed on a portable uh, iStat analyzer, which contains a motor uh, to control the flow of calibrant and sample within the cartridge. It has an electrical connector to receive signals from the sensors on the cartridge and also an a electronic system to measure and monitor the signals coming from those electrodes. These signals are transformed into quantitative results based on established calibrations. And um, you can see a very small volume of samples required, and it really varies depending on the test cartridge, but in general, two to three drops of um, whole blood is sufficient. This is uh, relatively easy to use. It doesn't require any sample pretreatment or pre-dilution, uh, and results can be in, obtained in just 2 to 15 minutes. Shown um, in the table on the right are different cartridges that are available. Um, listed on the right is the name of the cartridge, and in the left column is the class of biomarkers that are included in those uh, cartridges. So if we look at an example of one of those um, cartridges, we can look at the EC8 uh, Plus cartridge. It has analytes for chemistry and electrolytes, blood gases, and hematology. Um, so you can see various different um, electrolytes, the blood gases, which is both calculated and directly measured, as well as hematocrit and hemoglobin for hematology. And so each of these analytes might be shared in some combination across different cartridges. Another example of a point-of-care device that uses microfluidics with integrated motor control is the EPIC blood analysis system. This is, again, a common single-use point-of-care device used to measure various blood gases uh, and electrolytes in a single chip. So shown in this image is an example of a test card where you can see it has a sample entry port. 92 microliters of whole blood is applied and driven into the chip by depressing a syringe applicator. And there is a sealed calibrator reagent reservoir, which is released following the insertion of the card into the reader instrument um, via the action of a motorized mechanism that's uh, located within that instrument. And specifically, it's a push pin in the reader that breaks a valve in the test card and drives plungers, which causes the calibration fluid to flow across the sensor module on the card. Uh, the sensor module contains an array of sensors, which contact the instrument, which amplifies, digitizes, and converts raw sensor signals to a transmittable readout. The initial calibration of the card takes close to three minutes, um, but after that, sample can be applied and results after applying that sample can be uh, read out within about 35 seconds. Shown in this image is just what the EPIC uh, reader looks like. Um, this is what you need in order to use any of the EPIC test cards. And then shown in this table are an example of some of the different analytes that can be measured using the EPIC system. The third platform I want to discuss is 
centrifugal microfluidics. Um, on the, the platform, the cartridge is disc shaped, much like a miniature CD-ROM. And because of the shape, this platform is also sometimes called lab on a disc. In this system, the centrifugal force generated as the disc is rotationally accelerated plays a role as a pump, so to speak, in generating fluid flow. And the, the moving fluid in the microchannels moves from the inner radius um, where the sample is applied to the outer radius of the disc. And this flow can be modulated by varying the rotational speed as well as by integrating valves or different structures such as congestion, which helps stop the flow unless a certain acceleration threshold is surpassed. And so this allows precise uh, control of and movement of fluids throughout the disc. On these systems, readout is mostly limited to optical detection, because um, as you can imagine, with something spinning at such a rapid rate and, di uh, rate and different speeds, it can be difficult to make mechanical contacts, which might be necessary for something such as electrochemical detection. So if we look at an example of a centrifugal um, platform, we can uh, take a look at the Piccolo. Uh, this is a Clio Wave point of care device. Here on the right, you can see the Piccolo 8 centimeter reagent disc, and it's composed of three uh, ultrasonically welded plastic parts, which contain diluent, dry reagent beads, um, as well as the, on the top, a identifying barcode to identify the spinning um, program it will need. The total menu features 31 blood chemistry tests that range from liver, kidney, and metabolic functions to lipids, electrolytes, and, and other uh, chemistry analytes. Uh, these tests are available in 16 different panels, where each panel is contained on its own single disc. 100 microliters of sample is located at the center of the disc, which is then inserted into this uh, Piccolo analyzer shown on the right. And then the disc is operated with a program spinning profile specific to that disc. And this facilitates plasma separation, mixing with those stored dried reagents, and detection all within about 12 minutes. Um, this platform is, has optical detection, capable of monitoring 28 enzymatic reactions at nine distinct wavelengths. Shown here is just a selection of the panels available for the Piccolo. The analytes included on each panel are, are listed, and you can see that some of those analytes are shared across different panels. I think this is also an appropriate time to bring up one of the potential downsides of these lab-on-a-chip point-of-care platforms. Um, so one of our big pushes or advantages of lab-on-a-chip was to be able to multiplex and measure many analytes at once. And so clearly, you can see through these devices that I've shown, we were able to achieve this. But one resulting disadvantage of this was that oftentimes physicians are forced to get results of testing for analytes they didn't want. Um, these multi-analyte panels are pre-built and are not customizable. Um, so for example, if we look at this table and we say a physician wants AST and ALT, so they order the liver panel shown here. Well, in addition to the AST and ALT, they're going to get total protein, total, total bilirubin, amylase, so on and so forth. Um, so it may lead to problems as far as insurance reimbursement, how are we going to pay for these extra tests, um, and ultimately causes unnecessary and excessive testing, um, and, and is a, a challenge force by, uh, faced by all these multiplex lab-on-chip devices. Uh, that we're going to continue to have to figure out how we want to address. Now, the last platform I want to discuss today is digital microfluidics. Digital microfluidics is a technique for manipulation of discrete droplets on a substrate by electrical control of surface tension, also known as electrical wetting. So electrical wetting refers as the of the ability to of an applied voltage to modulate the wettability of a surface. So aqueous drops naturally beat up on a hydrophobic surface, but a voltage applied between the droplet and an insulated electrode can cause this droplet to spread on the surface. 
Furthermore, droplets can be moved by turning the voltage on and off in succession across adjacent electrodes. This really allows precise fluid control to discreetly dispense, move, store, mix, or even split tiny droplets within a network of connected electrodes. And this provides an alternative to the conventional paradigm of transporting fluids in enclosed channels, which is what I've discussed thus far. Um, it, this technology has actually been used for quite some time in the sequ sequencing field and has really revolutionized and eliminated many manual steps such as library preparation, quantification, and normalization, which has really allowed them to um, speed up the time of result for next-gen sequencing. Uh, in addition to the shared advantages of other microfluidic platforms, such as low sample volumes, low reagent volumes, automated processing, speed and portability, this digital microfluidics offers a couple other advantages, including that it's uh, it has no pumps and valves, so it eliminates the need for active components. Um, additionally, clogging is not as much of a concern in these platforms because we're not dealing with small enclosed microchannels. Um, but on the flip side, some of the disadvantages of this technology are that it has limited interfacing capabilities with other techniques. Um, and since the droplets are in the nano to microliter range, Evaporation can limit operation, particularly in open plate configurations. And then lastly, surface fouling is a concern. Um, surface fouling is, uh, occurs when there, you have an initial deposition of an organic fouling and, on the membrane surface, and subsequent growth of this fouling layer over time can adversely influence uh, membrane or system performance. And of course, if we're putting biological matrices in here, we, uh, there is some concern of um, fouling from that. Um, more recently, the application of digital microfluidics has entered the clinical diagnostics field with a platform invented by Babies. Uh, and in fact, Babies won the American Association of Clinical Chemistry 2020 Disruptive Technology Award for their digital platform, Seeker. So on this platform, an array of surface electrodes is layered by another plate to form a chamber in which droplets are sandwiched. And then the remaining space is filled with an immiscible fluid uh, filler. And this helps prevent evaporation that I had mentioned. And then it also helps facilitate the droplet transport throughout that sandwich. Um, all the reagents for testing are self-contained in the cartridge. And the system also allows for um, onboard thermal regulation. Uh, they developed the platform to be capable of enzymatic assays, immunoassays, and nucleic acid testing with integrated fluorescence and color metric detection capabilities. And so you can just see from the image on the right some of the different uh, capabilities you have. You can dispense reagent or sample. You can move it along the grid. Um, you can merge it with another uh, sample or reagent mix um, as well as split those droplets. Uh, shown here are the three different seeker uh, or three different babies platforms. So we have the seeker platform, which was their first FDA authorized platform for newborn screening. Um, this is initially what they launched their company for. And what they have approved on this platform are four different, the, they measure the activity of four different lysosomal enzymes from a single dried blood spot, and they can get answers in less than three hours. Um, the, the next system they have is the Finder, which is currently under FDA 510K review um, for measurement of glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. And then they have many other analytes on the Finder platform that are in the pipeline. Um, so this is definitely something that's forthcoming. Uh, the Finder uses whole blood and just requires 50 microliters of sample and can have results in 15 minutes. In addition, this company was able to use their digital microfluidics platform to develop a SARS-CoV-2 real-time PCR uh, assay, and this did receive FDA emergency use authorization, where they can take a nasopharyngeal or nasal swab 
um, in a viral transport media of a, a total of 100 microliters, put it on their chip, and get results in 17 minutes. Um, and then shown here is, is just a summary of a selection of some FDA-approved microfluidic base point-of-care tests on the market. And I don't show this to go through each one or even expect you to be able to read it, but rather I just wanted to illustrate how lab on a chip technology has really revolutionized and transformed point of care testing over the last two decades. Um, it allowed us uh, for the ability to develop these point of care assays by providing the technology that we needed to really reduce the size and thereby sample and reagent volumes, reduce testing time, automate and integrate some complex steps, and, and uh, make it into a portable size and, and be used in a CLIA wave setting. And although this technology has come a long way, there are still many challenges we'll face as the field is expanded further. So some of those challenges, um, real point of care testing uh, in terms of simple result, uh, sample in, results out, requires the integration and automation of all steps. Yet many assays still require extensive user intervention, mainly in terms of sample preparation um, and or reagent addition, um, as well as just trying to apply the sample to these cartridges and making sure there's an appropriate volume. So if there's some way to even integrate that, um, it would certainly help. Scalability is another big challenge for lab on a chip. Uh, this is essential for commercialization and it continues to uh, pose very profound challenges for these complex microfluidic structures. Producing mass quantities of highly standardized chips um, has certainly been a bottleneck. Um, as I mentioned earlier, hopefully advances in 3D printing technology will start to close that gap um, with respect to plastic microfluidics. Another need is to improve the sensitivity, selectivity, and stability of the sensing moduli. Um, because miniaturization tends to increase the, or tends to decrease the signal to noise ratio. And so as a result, the lab on a chip uh, provides poorer results than conventional techniques in the central laboratory. Um, so there are efforts to explore more robust recognition elements, such as aptamers, uh, antibody fragments, uh, molecularly imprinted polymers as well as using techniques such as magnetic microparticles to help amplify the signal, um, which can uh, lead to large improvements in this area. Another consideration is the use of uh, integrated or universal detectors. So currently, um, as I showed you, all platforms still require their own unique detector. Um, and these are pretty expensive and they may not be available, uh, particularly in resource limited areas. Um, so one area of interest in, in the research field still is to use smartphone technology to serve as a more universal detector um, for accessibility on many different, across many different um, tests or, or um, company cartridges. Um, of course, if we start to use smartphones, there's gonna be concerns for hygiene considerations, um, including both contamination and uh, uh, disposal issues. So these need to be definitely considered um, before smartphones can be deployed. Um, in addition, many platforms um, and development fall off in translation to the clinic. So there is a ton of these lab on chip devices in the research setting, many looking promising, but the required clinical validation um, the cost associated with that, the access to real clinical samples um, is a huge hurdle to get these from the bench to the bedside. Um, so really we might have to consider implementing some, some mechanism by which we can help translate these um, from the research setting into the clinic. And then finally, the, the, another major consideration is development of regulatory policies as well as social impact of these lab on chip devices, particularly in the setting of moving it closer to the patient. So questions such as, how are these products gonna be regulated? How will, be they, how will they be controlled and standardized? Um, what measures will be in place to report these results and aid interpretation? Because results are getting spit out so much faster, there's so much more to go over. Um, are we gonna be sure that whoever's receiving these results really understands them? 
Um, so as, as healthcare continues to move closer to the patient, it's also going to be crucial to educate these individuals on the testing, um, the importance of the patient preparation. Do they need to be fasting? Do they need to collect it in the morning or at night? Um, as well as the, the potential for inaccuracies due to improper handling of the testing. Um, it, they need to really recognize these so that if there is a false result, they, it doesn't cause unnecessary concern or harm to the patient. And with that, I would just like to conclude by saying lab on a chip has truly revolutionized the point of care testing, and it will likely continue to advance and change laboratory diagnostics as we know it. It's a very exciting field with lots more to come, and I thank you for your attention.